The Lord be with you. And also with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke chapter 14 and beginning at verse 1. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm going to read uh, from verse 1 right through to 14. And you'll find it, if you're looking, on page 1034. <coughs> One Sabbath, when Jesus went to eat in the house of a prominent Pharisee, he was being carefully watched. There in front of him was a man suffering from dropsy. Jesus asked the Pharisees and experts in the law, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent. So taking hold of the man, he healed him and sent him away. Then he asked them, if one of you has a son, or an ox that falls into a well on the Sabbath day, will he not immediately pull him out? And they had nothing to say. Then he noticed how the guests picked the places of honour at the table. He told them this parable. When someone invites you to go to a wedding, do not take the place of honour for a person more extinguished, more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host who invited both of you will come and say to you, give this man your seat. Then humiliated, you will have to take the least important place. But when you are invited, take the lowest place. So that when your host comes, he will say to you, friend, move up to a better place. Then you will be honoured in the presence of all your fellow guests. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Then Jesus said to his host, when you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers, your relatives, or your rich neighbours. If you do, they may invite you back, and so you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. And this is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Would you sit, please? The lectionary allows us to on, on today to leave out verses 2 to 6 uh, which is the healing of the man with dropsy uh, possibly and uh, most likely I think because the gospel last week as you may remember recorded the healing of a woman who was uh, suffering from uh, back problems uh, and had been for over 18 years In both Gospels, then last week and this week, there is a healing at the hands of Jesus. And there's also the question as to whether or not it is right, whether it's permissible to do something like this on the Sabbath day. So in both events, both last week in Jesus in the synagogue and today Jesus in the house of a prominent Pharisee, we're told he was watched closely. He was under intense scrutiny. And in both these contexts, 
they're, they're part of the whole record of Jesus on his way to Jerusalem where he's go no, he knows he's going to be killed. So he's on a journey to the cross and that needs to be remembered as being the, a real part of the context of what's happening. Jesus is facing great opposition from the leaders of the church, if you like, uh, intense opposition. And we know that they have even wanted to kill him way before this. So he knows he's on his way to Jerusalem and he knows what's going to happen there. He will be killed on a cross. So the close watching of Jesus had everything to do with the Sabbath day with whether or not it's permitted to do such a thing. And we know from last Sunday how indignant the leader of the synagogue was. He was angry and frustrated. He wasn't going to have a bar of what Jesus was doing. He said that's not the sort of thing to do on the Sabbath day. Let it be done on another day of the week. So the question was, was it okay to heal a sick person on the Sabbath day? And the scrutiny wasn't just curiosity. They weren't just simply curious about this amazing man. They were passionately seeking to find fault with him. Occasionally you'll find someone in the church who's with a bit of a passion to find a fault with the preacher. It has happened, I assure you. And in both of these events, last Sunday and this Sunday, in the synagogue and in the Pharisee's house, he picks up on their hypocrisy where they have shown not a skerrick of compassion for a person in great need. They would certainly, he says, I know, you'll, you know, you'll go out on a Sunday and if you're ass or ox is thirsty you'll give them water if your son fell into the well you'd certainly go and pull him out and here you are you're showing no compassion at all for this sick and needful person right in front of your eyes so we're told I think quite deliberately in Luke it was on the Sabbath day and yes, you may have had that before you last Sunday. I think it needs to be there again because this meal that we're now going to focus on, we're told, was taking place on the Sabbath day. So that's why I wanted to include that little piece and the healing was part of the deal because we know how they reacted the week before and I think these folk who were at the meal today in the Pharisee's house would have been reacting in very much the same way. The point of the Sabbath day was that it is and was, or was and is, a day to be kept holy. A day to be kept holy and solely for God. For the remembrance of the wonderful things he has done for his people. It's a day to stop. How are we going in our keeping of our Sabbath? our Sundays. To what extent do we really do exactly that? Sabbath, Shavah, means cease, stop, rest. How do we keep the Sabbath? Simply by doing just that, by stopping, ceasing from our labours and resting with God and with one another. And it's a very appropriate day for healing. A very appropriate day to frustrate the efforts of the evil one. What could be a better day for healing than the Sabbath day? And we need to know that the law of Moses did not prohibit healing at all. But the torturous pile of prohibitions cooked up by the elders it certainly prohibited it, but it was the elders who were doing the prohibiting, not the law of God, not the law of Moses.
and to end that little piece sadly in the church today and from time to time we find there are those who are watching when they should be worshipping watching and looking for fault to be fault finders instead of being worshippers instead of being those who build up faith in themselves and in each other. And it's very sad when that happens in the church of God, in God's house. So now part two. Jesus, after he's noticed the sick man at the table, we're told that he also notices those, the behaviour of those sitting around the table. He notices. He notices the person in need. He notices how we're going, or how we're not going, if you like. And there's a, a famous Thomas Merton, as I think I've got his name right, Merton, I know his surname, Thomas, a famous Trappist monk in the United States who has said this, people may spend their whole lives climbing the ladder of success only to find once they reach the top the ladder is leaning on the wrong wall. It's just so true. And I did mention a, a humorous story of an elderly man was up a ladder painting his wall and he noticed a lovely lady walking by and his heart machine opened the garage door. Jesus was speaking an uncomfortable truth. That's why I've included the whole story because it's just so easy to focus on what he then says about being humble and we can be very comfortable with what he says about being humble and, uh, and, and leave out really the whole, the seriousness of the context. Uh, these folk who were around the table had been elbowing each other to get a good place at the table. We've probably all seen an occasion where people have been pushing and shoving to get a good seat. It happens. It happens perhaps more often than we would like to acknowledge. Well, in G Jesus is speaking to people for whom the dinner, the, the dinner party, was a crucial, fundamental part of their living. Their dinner parties, parties were a statement, a very clear statement to everyone of a person's status. Whether they were in a, a seat at the top of the table or whether they are way down the bottom, uh, there was a real pecking order in the way the Jewish people understood and participated in their dinner parties. Not, not wholly unlike what happens occasionally today. So a person's seat at the table was vital currency in terms of their status, whether they were up or whether they were down, whether they were in good favour or disfavour. It had everything to do with everything, uh, almost, almost the most important thing in their lives, their status. What was their worth? What prestige did they have? Uh, and you know, our lives today are full of quite subtle and not so subtle symbols of, the, of uh, in our own lives that send out a message about our wealth or prestige or the lack of it. Usually it's based on economic power, about dollars and cents. And it's often been said that we don't always earn our place on the ladder. Very often we simply pay for it. So our clothing, the car we drive, the neighbourhood we live in, the place where our kids go to school, all those things may send out signals in our society about our place, where we are in the pecking order, uh, out and about. So when Jesus observes the way in which his fellow guests are observing this um, status by seating system, 
he speaks then these words about being truly humble. And humble's not the kind of our misreading of meekness, it's, it's a very sharp way of living that comes out of a very deep commitment to Christ and his call on our lives. So he sees them and he sees how good they are at elbowing each other aside and he doesn't in fact tell them to desert the whole system he tells them to deal with it in an entirely different way I mean all of us where we live in it it's going on around us and the call to Jesus to those at the table is very much the call he gives to us to live counter to the culture live counter to the way the world does things and do it the way Christ does it and take care to be willing to choose the lowest place so he says to them what he says to us we all have to make a choice don't we we all choose where to sit you've all done it this morning I don't know if I've had much choice but I did have a choice I sat over there where I perhaps I could have sat here but we do have to choose and but seriously, he said to them, you have to make a choose, a choice and choose, decide to choose the lowest place. Saying all those who humble themselves will be exalted and those who exalt themselves will be humble. So our choice is where we will sit in life and in situations where we find ourselves. And of course we can step right out of this, that system if we will simply by accepting the freedom that Christ gives to us that freedom Paul's about, Paul speaks about in Galatians in Christ we have wondrous freedom to live the way Christ calls us to live and so the call for us is to live God's way, to live the kingdom way, to choose the kingdom values, to live with a kingdom perspective and that's often called downward mobility. While we're all fussing about getting up, Christ is asking us to step down and do it for the kingdom's sake. So there's a world of a difference between the way of the world and the way of God's kingdom. So he's asking them to turn convention on its head, not to be stuck living according to the status quo. It's so easy for us because we all get comfortable and we're out in the world and we can very easily just trip along in the ways of the world. Often it seems to be much more comfortable. But Jesus is challenging them to not to be passive and accepting of the, the current pecking order, but to choose the way of the kingdom. And we know that sometime before this, he, they were talking of putting him to death for what he was doing in terms of forgiveness, that he claimed that he himself was the one who could forgive sin in the Father's name and they wanted to kill him this sometime before this. Now he's actually in danger again because he's calling people out to step away from the pecking order. That was a huge challenge in the society in which uh, he was preaching and teaching. It was a huge challenge. And you can be quite sure it was enormously provocative for him to do what he did and to say what he said. So the deep message in the gospel for us is that we're all to live and meet and eat together with a radical dependence on the grace of God, relying on God's grace before and above everything else. We can't stand on our accomplishments, we can't stand on our wealth or our positive attributes, well, as I said this morning, for heaven's sake, we can't depend on our good looks or our strength 
or even our IQ, or even our movement up or down the ladder. Our dependence must be upon God and God alone. For in the eyes of Jesus, we're all equal. In the kingdom of God, there is no pecking order. At the table in the banquet of heaven, there will be no pecking order. And this table in the house of God, there should never ever be any kind of pecking order. For all of us are equal at the table of the Lord. All of us. And so the gospel, in a sense, admonishes us to give up our cherished seat, to show hospitality to strangers, because we're told by doing it, some have entertained angels without knowing it. Do we have a guest list for our, the table of the Lord in this house? Are there any marginalised people out there who'd love to be at this feast? Do we know anyone in that case? And what will we do about it when we know it? So here we all are, we're observing the Sabbath. Surely that's why we're here this morning. It's the Lord's Day. We're called to keep it holy, to keep it entirely for God and under him to keep it for all others as well. So there's a question, what are we being careful to do today? And the Sabbath actually goes for 24 hours, not for a couple of hours on Sunday morning. It's the whole day and it's all for God, the whole of it. So are we allowing, who are we allowing to come to our tables of home? And who are we absolutely welcome and open to receiving in this table in God's house? Praying that it will always be a table of wonderful opportunity for all those who are hungry to enjoy such a meal. Amen.